I've seen two types of people mainly. Um, those who are very um, engaged in the mundane worlds, the worldly life, like the patients that I see, the very frail seniors, and the fairly strong younger seniors, and the caregivers of the seniors, and the maids, domestic helpers, and the formal caregivers, like those in the doctors, nurses that we see, and people in the government, the policy makers, academics in the universities, and universities overseas. So this is one group. There's another group of people that I see are the people in Chakavala Meditation Center, Buddhist Fellowship, people who go for retreats a lot, the ordained Sangha members, monks, nuns, and so on. And um, when I work with the first group of people, I just feel somehow if only they could learn a little bit of Dhamma. But you know Dhamma is not easy to share, it's not easy to teach, it's not easy to understand. You cannot just talk about it like that. People may not get it and they may misunderstand it and they may get the wrong thing, right? And for those who are um, in the pursuit of, uh, of the spiritual life, um, I worry a little bit for them. Maybe my worry is unfounded, but I do worry that uh, if they were to come to Singapore and um, do they have enough savings? Are they over-reliant on their CPF account? Um, uh, you know, and I've seen um, uh, uh, some people, um, spiritual or not, you know, in their old age, uh, they can be very lonely. Like I have a patient in our day center who used to go for a lot of retreat in the Thai forest. In the last stage of his life, he had no choice but to change his religion because it was just so isolated. Um, and uh, I have another patient of mine, uh, a few, last year I saw her, she, she was very thin and she was brought to me because she was uh, depressed and unsupported. She was only in her early 60s, quite well, you know, not married, no kids, living alone, taking only a loaf of bread for breakfast, sometimes half morning, half lunch, because there's no money. And she said that she's taking eight precepts. If she were to tell another doctor, they may not understand. But I understand what is eight precepts. You know, she was taking eight precepts. And she was telling me how she used to be so active in one monastery. But every time after the chanting and the thing, everybody just pack up and leave. There's no connection. There's no socializing. There's no friendship. Or, or I mean, everybody just give each other space, you know. I mean, you have your space, I have my space, we come here and chant and do the fa hui, then after that, we just bye-bye, you know, you have your own thing. And then she go back to her lonely world again. And she's always thinking of suicide, but she, she didn't do it because it is uh, un, unbecoming of a Buddhist. So the counsellor couldn't quite understand what she says, but I could understand. But when I heard that, I was reflecting on as a as a Buddhist in the Buddhist community, you know, have we done enough to support ourselves? Are we just talking of the high and lofty um, uh, Dharma ideals um, only and all the time? And a few years ago, uh, my boss embarked on a very interesting project to build a retirement village for monks in Bhutan. And uh, around last year, it was completed. I went there to visit before. It is in a hill at Punaka. Um, Punaka, you know, is a, is a winter getaway for the monks because when you're old, it's really quite cold. So you go to a lower part of the valley and there's a, we have a very nice retirement village there for monks. And it was on request by the chief monk of Bhutan that um, 
when the monks are very old, they can't live in the gompa, you know, with a lot of steps. It's not easy to get around. And the younger monks, no matter how, re how much respect or love they have for the senior monks, they do not have the skills of care. Caring for seniors as they become more and more frail require training, you know. And, uh, and these old monks cannot go back to the family of origin anymore because, um, I mean, we know, we know why. Uh, you left your family so early and then now you come back for your nephews and nieces to support you, you know. You cannot do that, right? So, so I had to build something like that. And um, so among Buddhist friends, I do uh, one of the t common topics. I was with a monk yesterday. We are actually talking about this. How should we support monks and nuns and Buddhist practitioners who like to practice to ease well into their aging, you know? And uh, I mean, if you ask some Buddhists, they, I mean, um, the second group of people, they'll say, I, I'm already prepared, I can die any time. But they do not know that you don't just drop dead, you know? You go through a phase of um, losing your relatives and friends, losing your ability to, to make money, um, to, uh, to even go to the toilet. And, uh, and sometimes you had to lose your memory as well. And, uh, and then we may not realize it. Social connection is so key. Networking connections. Social isolation is such a killer. So for this, I prepared this talk. There are two parts to it. The first part is to address the, the serious practitioners. The second part is to remind the people who are still engrossed in mundane living. Okay? So, uh, so it's called Successful Aging in the Dhamma. It's uh, many slides, so I'll be rushing through. Uh, I, I find sometimes I have this bad habit of packing a lot of content, but I may not have time to present it. But uh, let's, let, let me just attempt this. So the challenges of aging, um, many of us know it, but you may not know the details unless you have taken care of an aged person. But even then, you only took care of one. There are many, many ways that people can age. So I'd like to talk a little bit about frailty. Frailty is a new clinical syndrome that's discovered 2002 by somebody in New York City. Actually, we all know frailty is a common language, I mean, it's a, it's a word in the, in the English lexicon. But somebody defined it now that it is, um, that a person has got unintentional weight loss, walking speed is a bit lower, the head and grip is a bit um, uh, weaker, and then um, they are also feeling tired easily and they don't have a lot of physical activities. So it's actually quite prevalent. So as we grow older and older, we are at risk of suffering frailty. It is not a must, but it's just a very high risk, especially if you don't eat enough. You don't eat enough and not having enough vitamin D you will have sarcopenia, okay? Your muscles will become weaker, just like osteoporosis is for the bone, sarcopenia is for the muscles. So as you become weaker, our walking speed will become slower. And then as you do that, you become socially isolated. So you have frailty. And, and why is this a real syndrome? People who are frail are at high risk of disability, like falls and fractures, as well as death. So frailty is a common age-related issues. There are other common conditions seen in older people. Depression is quite common. 5.6% of older Singaporean Chinese uh, was done in a study in 2000, um, uh, quite long ago. I don't, uh, it's by uh, um, uh, Prof. Uh, Ng Zipin uh, from NUS. Um, and in, in some nursing homes, it's even worse. Uh, from this uh, spear, I think it's... Uh, American study, 16 to 50% of people living in nursing homes, okay? Then dementia, 2003 study by Kwa Yi Hyok, 6% of community dwelling persons older than 65 had dementia. And in the recent survey that we did in Wampo, those that are at suggestive risk of dementia was 10% above the age of 65, okay? 
urinary incontinence is about 10% or so from one study. Um, and falls, one third of those above the age of 65 suffer one or more falls per year. And we all know the consequence of falls. If you have a fall and a fracture, if you do not operate, then that is going to mean a life of chair and bed with pain. Okay? Of course, we need to operate, but operations, sometimes if your health is not so good, um, the doctors may not recommend it because you may be stuck in intensive care unit for a long, long time. Okay? So, so just a sidetrack, if there's a fracture, if your health is just can make it, you should have the operation. This is, the, this is best. If you don't have the operation, um, it is the beginning of the end. Oh. So these are common in older people. I'm just trying to say, I mean, I'm talking about the challenges of aging. Huh? I mean, um, and, and then handicap situation. This slide is just to say that it is not entirely due to our biology. Okay, you can see um, this is a diagram that is um, uh, delivered by, uh, by a professor of um, um, healthcare technology in, in a conference in Korea two years ago. He talked about handicap situation. As a person grows older, their, their function will decline but they may not be handicapped unless something happens and then they can drop into a, you know the bottom horizontal line is called the decompensation threshold. If they fall below the decompensation threshold, they become dependent, they cannot fulfill their roles. So the, the idea is maybe we can prevent the decompensation event from happening or we can raise the horizontal bar below. The decompensation threshold can raise by improving our living environment to be a bit more age-friendly, to use technology to make things more accessible in spite of your physical disability, and perhaps create a culture where people are more inclusive and more respectful of seniors, and perhaps create uh, Dharma centers like this to be more age-friendly. You know, people do not need to be handicapped just because of the decompensation that happens. So these are the few things that we can do. So, in other words, if you look at the challenges of aging, it is not just a mere aging process, it is multifactorial. And here I'm going to attempt to describe how the challenges of aging give rise to suffering. So, as we grow older, we have decreasing reserve. Decreasing reserve means our, our resilience becomes a bit less. It is only natural, physiological, that our heart function the cardiac output decreases. Like for those people above the age of 80, they, ha they have decreased by one third of their heart function in their youth. Although one third decline is, you can still function quite normally, but there's a decline in reserve. Meaning, if I am uh, a young person, I have a flu, I can still come here, okay? And I can still tell you, I just tell you I've got a flu today, you know? But if I'm an older person above the age of 50, 80, if I have a flu, I might not even get down my bed. I can't even come off, come off the bed because my reserve is lower. So a little bit of insult will lower it. So similarly for the lungs, the pulmonary function, vital capacity will be less. The kidney function will be less also physiologically. Huh? So, uh, and our muscle is also weaker and our uh, nerve is also less able to compensate. So these are all related to the physiology of aging. So aging creates a decreasing reserve. It doesn't mean you are less healthy. You can still function, but you just have less room to play with. Huh? So by decreasing, with decreasing reserve and decompensation events such as accidents and incidents. Incidents means diseases or some other um, uh, social uh, insult or accidents like a fall or a road traffic accident. You can have injuries or illness. And with repeated injuries and illness, you develop frailty and disability. And with disability and frailty, you will not be able to work. Okay? Normally, by right, age should not be something to prevent us from working. Only policies. It's policy that sets a retirement age of 60 or 55 or 65. Okay? Age itself is just a number. 
if you can work with the function, you should be able to do it. But because of aging, the frailty and disability, sometimes we cannot work. And in some societies, maybe Singapore is one of them, if you don't have work, your income will be at stake, okay? your disposable income. Uh. CPF at the moment, if you analyze it, it's not going to give you a lot of money. Okay? Many of us depend on our children. So basically, if you cannot work, you become insecure okay, with regards to money. right? Ageism has a role to play with it. Okay? By right, if you're frail or disabled, I can still design the work for you to contribute. But if somebody feels that it is too much trouble for me, I mean, if I employ this 60-year-old, he might be taking a lot of MC, then I might as well just use the same amount of money and employ somebody in his 20s or 30s. Okay? Or, or by just sheer idea that, oh, I've got two interviewers, these two are 20, 30s, and this one is 60. Mm. No, 60 years old. You have this discriminating feeling inside, that somebody at 60 cannot work. So this is ageism, okay? This is uh, irrational discrimination that just because of age you can't. Then an older person cannot find a job. I mean, those of us who had, um, I have friends during the financial crisis in 97, 2008, they lost their job either in their 40, that's it, okay? They can't find a job so easily, okay? So that's um, ageism at play. So with with the loss of this, with disability, you become less independent, and with, and if you're dependent, you can feel helpless because you did not choose this. You did not choose to be free. You did not choose to be disabled, and you feel very helpless, and you find that you cannot hang out with people so much so easily. Okay, you can get lonely, like the patients that I shared with you and uh, boredom. I mean, we don't think very much of boredom. Whenever we think about suffering, sickness, and so on, we always talk about diseases, you know? We don't think that uh, boredom, loneliness is something to be respected. But I tell you, boredom can drive people to repeated hospitalization, taking multiple medications, committing gruesome uh, verbal acts of violence, or perhaps there's a theory I think I read from Karen Armstrong, you know, they're spreading around. The, actually, it's, dr it's boredom that drives some youth to terrorism, self, you know, self-radicalization. So boredom is actually quite a serious mental health issue. Okay, actually, if you ask me, boredom is related to the unwholesome mind state of restlessness, but that's another thing. But so when there's loss of independence, there's a lot of boredom, a lot of loneliness, a lot of helplessness. And if you do not have income security, you do not have an income or you do not have that financial independence, it will aggravate all of this, you know. Why I say this? Because I've also cared for people who are very wealthy. Those who are very wealthy tycoons, they don't have much of this problem, okay? A lot of people will crowd around them, they can still um, dictate on things, they are not that helpless, okay? But those are the tycoons, okay? So, and, and the other thing about boredom loneliness is also this ageism. I got um, patients who complain to me, the wife, say that after the husband is like this, the children come here, they don't even go into the room because they are afraid of grandfather, you know? So disabled with the tube here and a lot of, uh, um, a lot of machines. So they stay far, far away. So same, do you find yourself visiting your senior friends less just because they are very frail and sick. You feel, I go there, I feel very helpless. Maybe I don't visit them, you know? So, with disability, frailty, dependence, and then with your friends all feeling a kind of a discrimination, they don't talk to you so much. They don't ask you for permission. They decide things for you, family members. So you feel totally helpless, lonely, and bored, okay? People, I mean, because out of their love for you, they send you to a nursing home, and then uh, there's roof over your head, there's food, there's water, there's TV. That's all. Imagine living like this for the rest of your life, and you do not know how long it's going to be. So that is marginalization as a result of misconstrued idea about aging. Huh? 
Loss of relationship, the green parts are the things that is actually external to a person. Okay, loss of relationships. That happens when, like my father when he was alive, every time he reads a paper, he's most interested to look at the obituaries. He's trying to see which of his friend has passed away. Okay, so, um, so a lot of, uh, as one grow older and older, you find that some people you're connected with, they start to pass away. Okay, so that is also aggravate the feeling of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. Okay, and uh, with illness and injuries, there's physical discomfort and pain. And with physical discomfort and pain, plus the emotional issues of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom, people can become needy. When we are secure, when we are content, we don't feel needy. We feel very confident. We are fine. But when we have got sickness, and we feel lonely, helpless, and bored, both of these act together. Every pain has got a meaning of catastrophe. Every weakness has a meaning of maybe it's a stroke. Every lump you feel, maybe it's a cancer, you know? And, uh, and, then, and then when you think that it's a cancer, you start to think, who, am, who is going to help me if I have a cancer? Who is going to pay for my care? You know, all these things sort of add up. Then you feel really needy. And uh, what it shows is a uh, people who is um, like uh, classically uh, more than 15 years ago when I started in, in Huami Mobile Clinic, I got this patient that I really remembered, Tiong Baru, um, the walk-up apartments. When your walk-up apartments, no leave, you cannot come out of the house. She's at home, she's from Penang. She's uh, always screaming and shouting, advanced dementia. And the daughter-in-law is very stressed because when she lies down, she wants to sit up, sit up, want to lie down. And when I saw her and when the daughter-in-law was telling me that, I sort of had an epiphany, you know, that, hey, this is something, you know, I'm getting on something. Then later, I see this pattern a lot. When they're, when they're in the hospital, they want to go home. When they're at home, they want to come to the hospital. When, when they're on the bed, they want to sit, sit, they want to lie on the bed, you know. So it is, they just need some kind of attention. I mean, now I know. It's related to universal need of love, okay? All of us need that. And when you're old and when you do not have the brain to inhibit what is proper or not proper, you will just be yourself. I need love, I just need love, okay? I need care, I just need to care. I need to wash my panties, otherwise my wife will be stressed. So they take out the diapers and put in the washing machine. I mean, these are the manifestation of emotional unmet needs that you never address when you are youthful. So the neediness is also related to previous experience. So I've seen people with dementia, very peaceful, very calm, very kind, very loving. I've also seen people with dementia, very agitated, very needy, a lot of unmet needs, uh, very attention-seeking. So it's related to their past, how they have lived their life course, what kind of history they've lived through. Where did they come from? Malaysia, Singapore, China? Did they grow up in Singapore? Were they from a wealthy family, poor family? How were they brought up? How did their parents teach them? Who are their spouses like and what kind of values they acquire in their youth. So these are related to a personal's past experience. And at that point in time, if there is no sense of purpose, there'll be a strong suffering of the mind. Okay. When there's no meaning, eh? why am I doing this? Why can't I just drop dead and kill myself? I mean, one of the things that a lot of patients you see, I try to practice good medicine. A good medicine, a good doctor is this. Before you do the physical examination or clerk history and everything, you like to have a chit chat with them and find out if I can help you, what would you like me to do for you? So that you can sense where is their purpose, then at least your care plan has a goal, you know, that's meaningful for them. But many a times, the older people, I ask this question, they'll tell me, just give me something to die, okay? because there's no sense of purpose. And with the mental suffering, it aggravates neediness, it aggravates physical discomfort and pain. This is a quote that uh, is quite interesting. It's from Viktor Frankl. I'm going to quote him again because he's writing uh, on uh, life search for meaning. He was a Holocaust survivor in World War II and he was a psychiatrist. And I find it's quite interesting because he himself is a survivor, so he, he deserves all the respect and he's got the, he's got the experience to share. 
His observations of the survivor in the concentration camp told him that if a person have no purpose, they will die from despair. Okay? We can have suffering, but if the suffering has a meaning, like for example, a mother um, doing many, many jobs in order to take care of a child, a widow, he has, she has a sense of purpose. But if, you're, if, you're, if you say you're suffering so much and there's nothing for you to care for, there's no purpose. And then your suffering has no meaning and it becomes despair. I mean, that is from Viktor Frankl. So, I've just talked the negative side of it. So, whew, okay, let's let go of the energy. And, okay, so, just, uh, just a glimpse uh, of uh, the possible challenges in aging. So, let's talk about the art of aging. So, all is not entirely so gloom and doom. So I'm just sharing with you some of the modern and uh, um, concepts that we are using. And even as in my workplace, we try to share how do you prepare for your old age. Okay, this is from a friend of mine who was in her 80s. She was a very, um, in her youth, she was a social worker activist, did a lot of work in America to, uh, to improve on the care of the frail and she started a model which was replicated across America, very successful, um, very earth-shaking. And uh, in her old age, she was in Singapore, and then I knew her. And uh, so when I was preparing this talk a few months ago, I asked her, you know, what to you is successful aging? She said that successful aging is where we can enjoy the many things in life, doing many things with interest as we age, which was very true of her life. She retired in ninety nine after a very successful career, setting up a new model for aged care in California. And uh, she bought a yacht and she sailed across the Pacific Ocean to, Ven to Caribbean, to Venezuela, went to what, Virginia, then went back to the Pacific side and then sailed across to Hawaii, bought a property, went to Australia, New Zealand, came to Savannah Cove of Johor and then knew somebody from Singapore and, um, and then came to Singapore, Sentosa Cove, and that's when we met. And um, she had a colorful life. She writes a blog. She used Apple. She introduced me to iPhone. At the time, I was using something else. Okay, she was the first adopter of iPhone and uh, iPad and and uh, Apple. Everything Apple. And she's a Buddhist wannabe, reading Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh, and all that. Okay, she was in her eighties, and this was to her the meaning of life, meaning of successful aging. Um, I'm not saying that that, that is, um, sorry, <laughs> okay, I, I'm jumping too fast, okay. Okay, so that, that was her view, but let us examine uh, this. So I'm using uh, uh, a few things that I feel are very practical for us who want to age well, okay. So this is from uh, WHO. It's, um, it's developed by Alex Kalachi, he's a doctor, but very instrumental. He was the director of aging and life course in uh, World Health Organization. So he developed this active aging framework to guide policymakers. He defines active aging as a process of optimizing the opportunities for health, lifelong learning, participation, and security. This big four, okay? in order to enhance quality of life as an individual age. And so these four key pillars are income security. So security extended to income security. Income security, in a lot of countries, they use old age pensions, but pension is not entirely so free from doubts. Huh? Um, pension comes from taxpayers' money. You actually... Uh, um, uh, there are some government that thinks that this is not sustainable in the long run, but there are some people strongly advocating for pension, so income security. Our civil support scheme, I think, is that direction. And I think I'm, I'm glad uh, to hear Minister talk about it, and it seems like it is sustainable for Singapore, but a civil support scheme is something like this, a uh, pension scheme. So income security for people who are old. Our CPF is one way, but CPF has been used in to use into so many things. You buy a house with it, you pay education for it and all that. So in the end, when you're old, it, it, it's not a lot, you know. Health and access to healthcare. For policy makers, if you want to create a population of active aging, you need to invest in health and access to care. 
participation. Active aging means participation. There must be framework where older people can still participation. It, participate. It could be in the form of work. It could be in the form of volunteer work still, no? or some kind of uh, way to add, to be engaged in the political scenes. Lifelong learning is only an afterthought. When they first developed this, only the first three. Lifelong learning was only added in the recent years, that they feel that without these three, you must have the fourth one. And it's not just limited to the healthy, ambulant older person. It's a life course approach. I'd like to elaborate on the point about not just limited to healthy, ambulant older person. Because a lot of people, when they talk about active aging, for example, our... I shouldn't be using too much local <laughs> examples. But there are some agency, when they talk about active aging, they use images of older people wearing leather jacket, playing electric guitars, or older people running a marathon, or an older person doing hang gliding. But that's not active aging, okay? Why should an older person emulate a youthful person in order to be themselves? It's not fair, it's ageism in a subtle way, okay? So this is saying that even if a person speaks only dialect, okay? Even if a person can only move around on a wheelchair, this person has the right, okay, we don't talk about right, but has a potential for active aging. And as fellow citizens, we should help them to have active aging, irregardless of their literacy level, of their disability level, and cognitive status. So this is the, 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 the ethos of this particular model from from WHO. So not limited to a healthy, ambulant older person, it's a life course approach. This life course approach is very, very important for Buddhist practitioner. I'm going to show you in the subsequent slides. It requires a multi-pronged strategies of national policies, community action and individual behavioral levels. So to elaborate on these four pillars, um, WHO used these six determinants. So for this, this Document is for policy makers, huh? but it has implication on individual. If you look at it, there are altogether six determinants. Starting from the top right corner, you have got health and social services. So that's why we have to develop our primary care, our social services, our hospital to make them age friendly, sufficient nursing homes. And don't just think about nursing homes, think of other solutions in between living at home and nursing homes, right? Then you go down clockwise to behavioural determinants. That is up to individual. Whether you smoke, whether you eat wrongly, whether you maintain a healthy lifestyle. Personal determinants is related to your life course, okay? How you have lived your life. Okay, this is uh, very Buddhist. Then, physical environment is related to our national, um, MND, Ministry of National Development, our um, LTA, our parks, you know, how do you make your HDB flat, your community, your uh, transport system, you know, uh, supportive of people aging in place. Social determinants is also the society, whether you still have the kampong spirit or everybody do not know their neighbours anymore, you know. So this will really uh, determine whether you have active aging. Economic determinants, well, if the country were poor, these are really just luxury, you know, we are at survival mode. So economic determinants is also particularly important. And also how the country is driven, say if you are mainly, um, agricultural society is very age-friendly, okay? So now you're in an urban society. If it's manufacturing, well, if you're older, your eyes are not so good, it's not so good. But knowledge-based economy, maybe it's very good but it requires a lot of training. So this is related to the economic determinants to how do you um, help people to age well. And in an environment of gender and culture, it depends on the culture, whether there's ageism and is there discrimination against genders. A lot of people, when they talk about aging for population, they think of CPA, they think about workforce, and they think the image is men. If you were to study across Singapore's history, 30s, 40s, 50s, and all that, women do not have full employment because that is not the culture, okay? So if you depend on CPF, the women do not have CPF generally. I mean, the modern ladies nowadays in the rooms here, I think many of you are again fully employed, but it's not the same for the previous cohorts. So if you think about it, the income security, the health and access to um, social care, 
the um, participation, lifelong learning is different between men and women. So even as you plan the policies, you must think men is one set, women is another set. Women would also live longer. So there are various things you have to think like this. So what's the implication for us as individuals? Behavioral determinants. There's one study in America funded extensively. I think uh, uh, it, it didn't say the amount. $10 million spent. And that was in the 80s and 90s. So that's a lot of money. And they did laboratory studies, studies on twins, uh, longitudinal studies, interviewings, uh, uh, interviews of um, older people who are, who are old and um, perceived generally to be aging very well. And this is their conclusion. Three areas. So this is for an individual. You can see the big picture. Active aging is health and access to care, lifelong learning, participation, income security. So you look at for individual, what do you do? You avoid diseases and disability. You maintain high cognitive and physical function. And lastly, engagement with life. So you can see um, I mean, avoiding diseases and disabilities. In the next few slides, I'm going to touch on it. And maintaining high cognitive and physical function, I'm not going to elaborate because I don't have the time, but it's really about us coming here, you know, learning new things, engaging with uh, um, new challenges, or continue working either with pay or without pay. With pay is gainfully employed. Without pay is as an active volunteer. So that's really maintain high cognitive and physical function. Engagement with life has an overlap with all this. It's about being actively and curious, maintaining the curiosity to participate within all that's going on in our environment, including work, family, friends, and maintaining a strong social network. So these are the three um, uh, recommendations after their studies. And one of the interesting things is that as a child, a lot is determined by your genes. But as you grow older and older, less and less is determined by the genes. Genes no longer count so much. It is how you have lived your life that count a lot on how you have aged. So just a few slides on health. Um, um, since many of you um, are very active learners of uh, Buddhist um, principles, so I just want to share with you what a doctor would advise. Okay. So we must think prevention, primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. And primary prevention will overlap with health promotion, okay? So how do we prevent? Okay, this is secondary prevention, but I will just share with you this. If you're 18 years and above, you need to be screened for diabetes. Uh, sorry, with obesity, not diabetes. Huh? You don't need to do a lot of tests. BMI alone is good enough. For Asian men, not more than 22.9. BMI is your weight in kilo kilogram divided by height in meters and square the height. So for example, uh, um, if you are uh, 70, years, uh, 70 kg and your height is 1.7, then you 70 divided by 1.7 squared. Okay? Then it should be less than 22.9. But this is for 18 years and above. But... Uh, the new findings in the last two to three years is that if you're above the age of 65, please do not go that way, okay? People above the age of 65 should be overweight, okay? People who are overweight has a better risk than people who are normal weight. People who are obese above the age of 65 is equivalent to the risk of people with normal weight, okay? So you should err on the side of overweight if you're above the age of 65 or older. Okay? But for younger people, try to be ideal in your weight, 22.9. And you should do this um, BMI test once a year. Okay? And if you're 18 and above, you should check your high blood pressure once every two years. There's no need to check so regularly. Okay? Then if you're 40 and above, you should be screened for diabetes by doing a fasting plasma glucose once every three years. This is from Health Promotion Board website and it's for general population. For you, if you have special condition, special family history, your own doctor will guide you how frequently is your screening. But for general people, this is it. Huh? So some of us need to screen more frequently. Okay. 
hyperlipidemia, which is cholesterol problem, above the age of 40, everybody should be screened once every three years. Colorectal cancer, for everybody above the age of 50, if you have family history, you have to start 40, okay? So 50 years and above, colorectal cancer, and you can, the screening recommended is fecal immunochemical um, test, which is to check your feces for, for, for blood. But of course, if you do a colonoscopy, it's better. Okay, if you do this uh, school or stool or cow blood test, you have to do once a year. If you don't do, if you do a colonoscopy and it is clear, you only need to do once every 10 years. So 50 years and above, um, you should also, uh, okay, that's the next thing. For ladies, okay, from, okay, we had from 30 to 69, you had to screen for cervical cancer doing pap smear once every three years. There's no recommendation for, for vaccination against uh, um, cervical cancer yet, but um, in Singapore, there's no recommendation. But in, uh, in America, they've already got guidelines for the vaccination for cervical cancer. Then for women, 50 to 69, you should have breast cancer screening mammogram. But of course, if you have family history, you should screen it earlier. So this is a general recommendation from Health Promotion Board. Then we talk about, those are the screening, good habits for primary prevention. Do not smoke if you have not started. If you have started, quit. Okay? Drinking, do not drink. Watch your diet. Regular and appropriate exercise, mindful of your weight. So these are the good health habits. Vaccination, regular checkups, treat all symptoms with care. The regular checkups is the, the chart I showed you just now. And every symptoms, take treat with care. Read and learn widely about health issues and do not neglect mental health. Don't doctor hop. Okay? Go to one family doctor that you trust and continue the relationship. Because sometimes every condition requires the same doctor a few times before can, they can make a diagnosis. If you skip the doc doctors, they may either over-investigate or under-investigate for you. Calorie restriction, this is for younger people. Um, it's well known that uh, there's nothing you can do to change the lifespan of a species of animals except calorie restriction. Okay? So um, it's also found that, um, I mean, the mechanism is not so sure, but uh, it's related to antioxidant uh, defense capacity. Okay, life course approach, I talked about it just now when I talked about the, the four pillars of active aging. Life course approach is really about the interdisciplinary conceptual framework in guide, to guide research policy in relation to health and human development and aging. Um, recently, I've got new learnings on it, but this is the chart given by um, uh, Alex Kalachi when he was um, talking about active aging. The idea is this. If there is a threshold, like the first slide I show you, there's a disability threshold. As you're born, you are disabled. All of us are born disabled, right, as a baby. But as we develop, we become more and more enabled and when we are adult life we are totally efficacious we can do many things we can run we can uh, make tough decisions so we are the best and if you maintain your um, health in your adult life chances are you have a more slopey curve towards your old age so even when you're of extreme old age maybe in your 80s or 90s you might not have gone under the disability threshold, you might still maintain your independence. Whereas if for somebody in the adult life has been so busy, working so hard, never have enough sleep, smoking, drinking, never check the blood pressure, always putting on weight, then they'll reach their disability much earlier. Okay, this is true for health, but it is also true for income security, lifelong learning and participation. Just imagine, I mean, there are some financial planners here, they'll tell you, insurance, you should buy it early. Financial planning, you should start when you're young. If you start when you're old, then perhaps you're more vulnerable, right? Lifelong learning. If in your youth, you're somebody who is never interested in learning anything, you know, you're just going around, emotion, just uh, uh, floater, floating around, then at your old age, you might be somebody who is always locked up in the house, not interested in anything. Don't feel like learning, feeling nothing is meaningful for you. Okay? Participation. 
if in your youth you don't make friends, you're always very reclusive, stay at home, play computer games, in your old age, or just order Coke and McDonald's to your house and eat, right? I've seen a, a boy, he had got urine problems, she cannot pass urine. And when I checked, he was playing computer games until he for, for, forwent his uh, urine urge, until he could not pass after that, okay? I mean, um, so you know what I mean. So participation starts from young too. You need to lead an active social life in your youth. I mean, it's a bit tougher for introverts like many of us, but you need to make friends and have to broaden your social network. So that uh, will help with our life course. And the reason learning I have about life course is not just your behavior through the life course. It's also related to the people you have met throughout your life course. I mean, in Chinese, we talk about gui ren, right? Uh, it's also, so it's related to linked lives is related to life course, which is uh, your, how you behave, is related to events, okay? People living through the tumultuous 50s and 40s will have a different kind of aging from us born in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, okay? And, um, and uh, the, the lecturer who shared with me this, the people who are, who are the youth, uh, who graduated now in Spain, facing 50% unemployment, will have, a, will have a different kind of aging experience from youth in Singapore, you know, almost full employment, it will be different. So the, the, the politics and the history of a country will impact on the aging experience of a person. So that's also life course. Okay, so I will come back to this diagram. So, what is the implication on, for us to deal with the challenges of aging? So with regards to decreasing our reserve, illnesses and injuries, we should, I mean if we could, invest in health promotion and disease prevention. Like I told you, vaccination, exercise, maintain your weight, uh, don't be overweight in your youth, uh, go for health screening regularly, you know. And with regards to income security, we should plan our finances early and we should exercise financial prudence as a habit. And with regards to loneliness and social isolation, it is about treasuring relationships, be it in your own family or your spouses, your parents, your children, because how we treat our parents, our children will learn, okay? And if we love our children and respect our children, they will love and respect us in return, although it's not a transaction, of course. And our friends, how we maintain our friendship as we traverse through life. I mean, a lot of younger people, I, I remember in my youth also, when this person cannot click, I don't have anything to do with this person anymore for the rest of my life. And after a while, through your life, you just destroy many relationships, okay? So... Don't break relationships, just try to understand, okay, to maintain relationship. Lastly is the sense of purpose. So that's where faith, values, inspiration and the sense of purpose come in. So just talk about the sense of purpose. This is also from Viktor Frankl. Those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Do you know what it means? <laughs> So uh, it's uh, from, from his experience, if you, if you know why certain things are done and why you have to live, you can live with almost any kind of conditions. It's important for us, I mean for us when we think of aging, we think of ourselves, here I'm aging, you know, I'm um, going on to my late 40s, you know, 50s, very soon, you know, as you grow older and older, you don't count in terms of years, you count in terms of decades. 50, 60 is very fast, okay? Those who are older than me, I'm sure they feel it even more acutely, okay? Um, it's not just that. It's also, we have to be prepared. One day, we will have to be a prison in our own home or in a nursing home. Are we ready? We may have to be prepared to have our dignity not respected. Although, we are trying to improve it, okay? I mean, I'm working in this sector, we're trying to improve it, but sometimes you can't help it. We may have to be prepared that people 
make throw away our things in our homes and force us to stay in a one a room in a nursing home and throw away all our treasured memories, our furniture. We may even have to be prepared to allow people to change our diapers. Men, women, anything. Just open everything up and close everything up. Shower for you, okay? We may have to be prepared that uh, we have to undergo operation. Nobody console our fear. Nobody tell us, don't worry, you'll be all right. They'll just put you into a cold room and then operate on you. So we have to be prepared for all this. It's a little bit like going through a prison or a holocaust. So we have to be prepared by always knowing why. And that's why, for me, that's why uh, I need to practice the Dhamma, you know. So this is a summary side of the first, first uh, lecture. This, and it's already near the end of the, my course. So anyway, the, the rest is Dhamma. So Dhamma, I think I can do it quite fast. All of you are Dhamma experts. So successful aging, it's really about increasing our reserve throughout the life course. We do not know when we will become frail or we do not know when we will, be, we will die. We just need to know that we need to invest in wealth, health, relationship and spiritual resilience. Okay? Then when we do all this, the, the unpredictable will be unpredictable, whether you like it or not. But at least we are giving it effort towards health, wealth, relationships, which are the health part is evidence-based. The spiritual rela resilience, what is that? The fine prints. I need to take out my glasses now, see? Uh, it's about engagement with life, maintaining high physical and cognitive functions, lifelong learning, faith values, inspirations, and a clarity of purpose. Okay, so spiritual resilience is about always having a clarity of purpose. Whatever we do, we need to know why. We start a relationship, we need to know why. We end a relationship, we need to know why. We engage a work, we need to know why. We quit from a work, we need to know why. We come to medical dharma, I mean, we come to a dharma circle like this, we need to know why. We stop coming, we also need to know why. So the clarity of purpose is very important. So that's spiritual resilience. So that's end of part one. Part two is uh, equally long. I don't have the time. But um, I think I will just share with you uh, um, some slides which are very in, in, in important. So what is aging? Uh, Venerable Shariputta talk about aging in terms of the, the features of aging. But what is the purpose of aging? And it is very interesting, it's found in a commentarial text. The purpose of aging, the characteristic is maturing or aging or ripening of material phenomena. So this is a commentary to the Abhidhamma and it's in terms of uh, ultimate realities. Okay. The function, which is the purpose, is to lead them towards their termination. Aging has no purpose, it just leads towards death. In a way, if somebody asks a question, what's the meaning of life? The life means birth, aging, sickness, and death. That's the meaning of life. Okay. So function is to, well, you can say, no, no, it's not that it's more meaningful than that. But um, we shall see. Okay. So manifestation is the destruction and fall as loss of newness without the loss of being. This is for a meditator observing the aging of a, of a material phenomena. The proximate cause is materiality that's maturing, decaying, or ripening. That's the purpose of aging, lead them towards their termination. If aging is merely a phenomenon that leads to death, surely a good aging must lead to good death. Correct? Yeah, most people will agree. Because aging, no matter how successful, you must die. Okay? So, if the the purpose of aging is to lead to death. No matter how glorious, how beautiful this, this uh, firework is, it will come to naught. So successful aging, no matter how successful you are, participation, income security, health, whatever, you will still come to a good death, a death. If you can die a good death, then whatever the successes, you can have a good death despite your illness. You can have a good death despite poverty, but you feel content and adequate. You can have a good death despite being alone and not feeling lonely, you know. So there are all these things that 
um, perhaps it's really about whether you can attain to a good death. So what is a good death? I think Shariputta has a definition. Did I write a quote here? Okay, good death, okay, this is my own conjecture. Okay, what is good death? It depends on whether you believe in an afterlife. Okay? For those who believe in afterlife, a good death is about going to a good destination. Okay? Like heaven, you know, the very glorious, very bright, people flying, walking, you know. Or a uh, uh, peta realm, it's all very dark, everybody is very scrawny, very hungry, you know. Everything you eat uh, cannot, um, doesn't nourish you. You know, it's all um, the, depends on the, the, the will of life. So, whether a good death or not depends whether you believe in an in a afterlife. There are people who do not believe in the afterlife, okay? People who do not believe in an the afterlife, there's no such thing as good death or de bad death. If life is really tough, they may just kill themselves because there's no purpose. Okay, so Buddhists and many other religions believe in afterlife. Okay, so a good death is really about having a good afterlife. But actually there's something higher than this from the Buddha. But I'm just talking from a, a very mundane way. A good death is when we have a good rebirth. Then we know in theories, the rebirth is determined by our ignorance, by our clinging, by our craving. Because of our clinging, our craving, which is actually a kind of addiction, which are, which are rooted in ignorance, we think certain things are happiness and we chase after them and we feel that feeling is happiness, so we always crave for good feelings. This is all ignorance. And we do, and we create them, either good karma, bad karma. So because of karma, and then we have got rebirth consciousness, materiality and mentality, six sense basis, contact feeling. And with feeling comes craving, clinging, and another karma, and then birth, and then aging and sickness. And then rebirth. So when we talk about karma, it's really, a, it's really the sankhara, the volitional formations. Uh. If you study the Abhidhamma, it is at the level of one of the mental factors called chetana. It has a motivation to it. Okay? Volitional formations carry karmic force. There is ethical vol vo volitional formations equals to good karma. So if your karmic force is ethical, then this karmic force is a good one. Despite the ignorance, craving, whatever, it will create a good rebirth for you. And it is, there are four kinds of karma, weighty karma, habitual karma, death proximate karma, residual karma. It depends on how you've led your life, you've led your life, and whether you have a habit of appreciation, of respect, of generosity, of loving kindness, and enjoy meditation, keeping the precepts like a principle, guarding, you have a, you're a person who is principled throughout your life, then chances are your habitual karma is a good one. Then whatever your successful aging, not successful aging, on the last point in time, well, you have a good death because your habitual karma is a good one. Unless you have a weighty karma such as um, uh, attaining to jhanic meditation or when you do something weighty like killing your father or mother, you know, so those will supersede your habitual karma. But generally, the habitual karma will, will take effect. So good karma equals to wholesome mind because the Buddha says karma is your, is, is your chetana, is your intention, okay? He said uh, intention is karma. So karma is all here. It's manifested in the speech and the behavior that create that result. You actually break precept or not depends on whether you translate into speech or the behavior. Otherwise, it is just karma of the mind. So wholesome mind is a mind that is free from delusion, greed, and hatred. And also, so it's associated with, okay, this one is I mentioned just now, a mind that's uh, full of respect for self and others, which is a proximate cause for shame and moral dread. Um, um, these two factors uh, are a uh, necessary component of wholesome mind. Uh, um, uh, and uh, so uh, this fear of wrongdoing, non-attachment and non-hatred, faith, mindfulness, equanimity, and lightness, these are all components of a wholesome mind. So you can imagine, if your mind is habitually wholesome, then chances are you have a good death. So examples of wholesome mind, generosity, service, keeping precepts, meditation, 
reverence, sharing merits, rejoicing in merits, sharing Dhamma, listening to Dhamma, straightening up our views. Then the 31 planes of existence, the upper ones are the heavens, and then the humans, these are all the good planes, you know. The lower ones are not so good because when you're in an animal realm or in a ghost realm, it's a lot of suffering, okay? And the mind is habitually needy, sometimes angry because of, uh, you know, like birds and, and cats uh, and, and dogs or so. There's territory, you know. Somebody come in your territory, you want to fight. There's a lot of aversion mind, uh, a lot of uh, um, stinginess mind. So we know that as long as there's ignorance and craving, there'll be new existence after death. And when there's new existence, it's a good plane or woeful plane, depends on the moral quality of the volitional formations in the Javana moments, in the very last stop moment. Okay, this one, um, uh, if you don't understand, never mind. Basically, it's about where we go depends on the last thought process. Okay, where our rebirth is depends on our last thought process. If you ha our mind is habitually wholesome, someone who is very respectful, very kind, very happy and just very open, chances are you have a good death. So with a new existence, preferably a good one, comes with a new life. Okay, so we talk about successful aging and aging is a function. The function is to die, so a good death. And with a good death, you have a new existence, preferably a good one, because that's the definition of good death new life, and then you have to ask yourself what's the purpose of life again, because you know the sense of purpose is so crucial. And that's when I remember my friend says, doing many things, experiencing many things, learning many things, and that sounds to me maybe sensual pleasures. But um, now she's staying in a nursing home. The, the last time we Skyped with her, yeah, it's, um, it's not so easy, okay? You cannot control how you age. Even you may have certain ideas how you want to age. So essential pleasures, the, the purpose of life, having nice food, going to different places. Or could it be a bit higher? We are, our meaning of life is to go, do good deeds, is to help people, is to practice compassion. But I will ask you again, what is the purpose of good deeds and compassion? Of course, it's not so easy to answer, but you, I mean, all of us do our things with a certain sense of purpose. It's very personal, very private. It depends on determinations you've met, you set long ago, maybe past lives. Okay, maybe it's inspiration and so you aspire towards something. Happiness. Maybe the meaning of life is to happiness. But I will argue, Marijuana, you know, apparently if you take marijuana, it's very happy, right? Why don't we just, you know, just take marijuana? Right? Good aging. If the meaning of a good existence is about good aging, then I must ask you, what is good aging for? It's good death. What is good death for? Good existence. Good decision for good aging. It's really quite circular, right? So, um, so I was thinking, you know, when you are living your life, we are born because we want to be born, because we're addicted to a pleasure about life. And then because of that, we do certain things, good things, bad things. And it's the, the smart people taught by the Buddha will do good things to have a good rebirth. And rebirth for what? So that we have eyes, ears, nose, tongue and all that to experience the nice things again, you know, good things to see, good sounds to hear, good smell to taste. And for what? What for? So that there is good feelings, okay? And when there's feelings, you'll be craving, okay? Clinging, you need that good feelings. So basically, we're like, a whole life evolves around getting good feelings again and again and again. It's all about good feelings. And so we, we have craving and clinging. And for those of us who are who are not so intelligent, they break precepts in order to get good feelings. But for those of us who are wiser, we will, we will practice good, 
karma in order to have good feelings, right? Uh, so we take care of our children, our friends and all that so that we can have good feelings, good karma. And then we take care of our health. We don't kill so that we have successful aging. And what for? For us to perpetuate that contact, uh, eye, ear, nose, tongue, contact in order to get a good feeling, right? So the quest for perpetual sensual pleasures and the avoidance of pain and sorrow because of ignorance and craving and clinging, karma was committed and sense doors were formed. Sense doors were formed for the sake of contact and pleasant feelings and they are sustained by food. Okay. So just before you pass away, this, uh, the, the karma ripened okay. and then the last stop moment happened and based on the energy of that last stop moment, the karma which is related to your habit or weighty karma okay, or death proximate karma, what happens during your aging process? This karma ripened and then you have a good rebirth. And when you have the good rebirth, it corresponds with what you want. Karma is created with a wish and the wish sometimes is called subconscious. Sometimes we do certain good things like I, I reflect for myself, why am I like a doctor doing so much, caring for people, blah, blah, blah and all that thing. Vanity. Maybe I'm just addicted to humans, you know. I just like this connection with people, the human warmth. So you have to reflect for yourself. And it may not be explicit that I do this in order to be reborn in heaven. Sometimes because I do this in order to be among friends. And this wish of yours will come true. In a new birth, you become a human again, connecting with the same group of people in different forms. Or you become a deva, a heavenly being, always showering your love and compassion on the human realm. So it will create something which is your wish, wish fulfilled based on your karma. The mind causes the rest of the physical body and its organ system to look for food and the more pleasures. Okay, this is related to this. When we, when we are reborn, then we have all the six sense spaces and we continue to go around our things and then you find that the whole body, all the organs are sustained by food. Okay, the food that you eat will actually go to support all these organ system. What for? So that they can take the enjoyment, right? And then support also the whole body. And the mind will create a certain, uh, will create a cause for the whole body to move towards getting the sensual pleasures for your eyes, your ears, and nose. So the whole being will move around just to create that eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and mind contact, and the bodily contact. And then also to get the food to support all these. Okay, so this is about life. This, this is what life is all about. Okay? Intelligence teaches us good karma begets good existence and good sensual pleasures and less suffering. And so we practice good karma. Unfortunately, aging takes place, the loss of newness without the loss of being like an aged paddy. Then death, but with good karma, we hope for a renewed existence in a good plane and sensual pleasures and less suffering. The Buddha's teachings on happiness, there are two kinds, happiness of sensual pleasures, happiness of letting go. The one on letting go is the one that he recommends. Okay. And happiness is not just pleasant feelings because the Buddha said in the, in the Sangyutta Nikaya, friends, the Blessed One does not describe a state as included in happiness only with reference to pleasant feeling. Okay? The Tathagata describes whatever is without suffering as happiness. The Buddha did talk about happiness, but his happiness is not just your happiness, the pleasant feeling. And suffering is not just unhappy, unpleasant feeling. We think that suffering is unpleasant feeling, but he says whatever is felt is included in suffering. That means all feelings, pleasant feelings, neutral feelings, unwholesome, unpleasant feelings, these are all suffering. Okay? And what is happiness? It's the end of suffering, right? So Shariputta says it's Nibbana. And Shariputta explicitly talked about good death. He said, Friends, a bhikkhu passes his time in such a way that he has a good death. And how? Does not delight in work. Does not take delight in work. Is not devoted to delight in work. In talk, in sleep, in company, in bonding, in proliferation. When a bhikkhu passes his time in such a way, he has a good death. 
This is called a bhikkhu who delights in Nibbana, who has abandoned personal existence to completely make an end of suffering. So, um, a good death is a person not delighting. Delight means clinging and craving. You can, you can work or even enjoy your work, but you need to know, are you addicted to work? Are you addicted to talk, to sleep, to company, to bonding, and to proliferation? Proliferation is a very interesting thing because of nowadays on Facebook, there's so many talks and theorizing and comments. It sounds to me like proliferation. Let's see what proliferation means. Papancha is a proliferation of defilements occurring by way of craving, views, and conceit and inducing intoxication. So, uh, because do not indulge in these things, do not have craving for this, do not delight in this, do not, are not addicted to it, and he, will, he delights in Nibbana. Okay? This is making an end of suffering. Then when he passes his time like this, he will have a good death. And the Buddha says, just as a tiny speck of excrement stings, so do I not commend existence even for a moment, not even for a, as long as a snap of finger. That's when I talked about just now. It's not just about good existence, but the Buddha doesn't recommend even one more moment of existence. Okay? So, um, the rest is of the same content. The time is really quite short. I'll just... Uh, the practice of Dhamma, I think many of you had known, is really the noble effort part. Ah, I'll just show you, and also practicing the paramis, the conclusion slide, which is this one, for if you want to live mundanely, conventionally, as a lay people like us, you know, we need to invest in health, wealth, relationship, and spiritual resilience. Okay? Um, Okay, so we need to take care of ourselves in the conventional way too. And if you want to talk about spiritual resilience, it's really about the search for purpose. And the purpose to really get to the bottom of it is not another round of good rebirth because at the end of it, it is meaningless. It is to make an end of suffering, which is the third noble truth. And the way leading to it is wholesome mind with the right view. Okay, this is the noble eightfold path. And uh, this is the final slide. I just want to read to you a verse that was written by Siali Dipankara in 2009. Evening Reflection. Do you know where you came from? What are you doing now? What do you, where do you want to go? We have seen the sun rise. Now we are using up the energy from the sun. Soon the sun will be setting. Are you ready to face the sunset? Will you be happy or worried when the sun sets? I will also have to face the sunset very soon. Before that happens, I want to build a pagoda in my heart. The pagoda will be built with loving kindness, compassion, patience, truth and understanding. I hope that you will also build the pagoda in your heart before the sunset arrives. When you see the pagoda, wisdom will arise with happiness and the sunset will be beautiful for you. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ng, for a very insightful way of introducing a Four Noble Truths. I think... Uh, uh, there's a lot of phenomena that he has described. Most important is that he has described four important pillars for us to take action now. It's a very good wake-up call. I think we talk about aging, it's always about uh, later on, uh, after we have uh, finished all our pursuits, and then we will start preparing for aging. But it's a wake-up call saying that we should start preparing for aging now. Maybe just one question, one burning question, because today we have AGM. Maybe just one burning question. For Dr. Ng. Anyone? If there's no burning question, so uh, maybe, uh, can, can we say sadhu three times again? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So a bit of uh, announcement, a real announcement.